literature webinar series um, where the last uh, novel we did um, was um, Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. The next one we're going to do is Toni Morrison's Beloved. And right now, William Faulkner as I Lay Dying. Um, I am delighted to have for our participants um, two of three. There was a family emergency that canceled our last uh, scheduled participant. But we have Dr. Robert Hamblin, who is Professor Emeritus at Southeast Missouri State University, where he served as the founding director for many years of the Center for Faulkner Studies. And then Dr. John Lowe, uh, who is Barbara Methvin Professor in the Department of English at the University of Georgia. And previously he was Robert Penn Warren, Distinguished Professor of English and Comparative Literature and Founding Director of the Program in Louisiana and Caribbean Studies at Louisiana State University. He has also served as President of the Society for the Study of Southern Literature and the Southern American Studies Association. Now, both of our uh, panelists have long and distinguished publications. I, I'm not going to say that, but they will appear in uh, your chat button below, I trust within mere minutes, ideally with Amazon links. So you can go and you know purchase and contribute to the Dykery Fund for both of our professors. Um, the chat button and the Q&A button <coughs> are where you, the audience, will contribute your questions after the roughly 12 to 14 minute speeches from each person. So your questions are, are going to be what makes the webinar. Please put in as many as possible in the course of their talk and continue doing them. I answer questions in any order that makes for what seems like a fun conversation. If by any chance your question isn't answered by the end of our session today, send it to me, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L at nas.org, and I will forward your question to our participants so they can have the option to respond directly to you. So don't worry about any questions, they won't go orphaned. Um, if you have to leave suddenly, uh, this will be up and recorded in perpetuity on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel within 24 hours. So you'll be able to see it, see it, send it to your friends, um, look at it at whatever time you like. Now, having said all that, I would like to um, stop and uh, invite uh, Dr. Hamblin. Would you be so kind as to give the first talk? Thanks, David. And hello, John. Good to see you again. We've uh, shared some Faulkner platforms before, haven't we? I first read As I Lay Dying uh, many years ago in a Southern Lit class at Delta State University. I distinctly remember my first impression of the novel and it had nothing to do with the story being told. I was simply amazed at the unusual way that Faulkner chose to tell the story. All those characters jumping around in time, each telling his or her own version of the events, it was like Faulkner had thrown a deck of cards on the floor and it was le left uh, me to pick it up and uh, reassemble uh, 52 pickup, or in this case, uh, 59 pickup. I found the technique daring, innovative, awesome. And I was so taken with Faulkner's technical virtuosity that it hardly mattered to me uh, at, at, that I was having trouble uh, holding all the cards in my hand and arranging them into some kind of coherent order. As I Lay Dying is a good place to start reading Faulkner. Although the narrative technique and characterizations are quite complex, the storyline is actually quite simple and relatively easy to follow. The tone of the story is both tragic and comic, the characters funny and pathetic. The language is fresh, lively, memorable. And the subject matters are as huge as subjects can get. Life and death, love and hate, faith and doubt, sanity and madness, individual and family, family and community. Significant stuff. 
As I Lay Dying is an outstanding example of what is called stream of consciousness narration. The term is borrowed from psychology and is used to identify any literary narrative that focuses upon the unspoken thoughts of the character. The emphasis is upon random, disordered, fragmented, and momentary stream of thought before it has become conscious speech. Novelists who have become noted for their extensive use of stream of consciousness include Marcel Proust and James Joyce, both of whom heavily influenced Faulkner. Authors who are drawn to stream of consciousness recognize that all of us actually live two lives, an external one in which we interact with other people in the outside world, and an inner one that is comprised of our private, unspoken, even unconscious thoughts. Stream of consciousness writers focus on this second life of their characters. But it should be noted that Faulkner is something of an exception in this regard, since even in his most extended stream of consciousness narrations, there is always a substantial action that is being referenced. In fact, one way to view Faulkner's place in the history of the novel is to recognize how he combines the traditional emphasis upon action and plot with the modern concern for mental processes and the psychological motivations for human behavior. A Faulkner novel is concerned with both what happens and why it happens. Consider how this definition applies to As I Lay Die. Certainly there is an unfolding external action that the reader follows with interest and suspense. Addie Bundren has died and her husband Ants has promised that he will bury her in town. Their oldest son Cash is making a coffin for her and the entire family is preparing to transport the body by mule-drawn wagon to town. Much of the novel deals with this trip and the obstacles the Bundrens face all along the way. But this surface action is not at all what Faulkner's great novel is really about. The real journey a reader takes in this book is not to Jefferson, but deep inside the complex, conflicted, and often nightmarish thoughts of the characters. Darl's brooding questions about identity and reality. Jewel's pent up anger and desire for revenge. Cash's obsession with neatness and order. Dewey anxiety over her personal circumstance. Bartman's innocent confusion over death and grief. Ants's inner struggle between inertia and honor, that is frustrations, regrets, and secrets. These are the dark, hidden places explored and exposed by Faulkner's marvelous stream of consciousness narration. Faulkner's use of stream of consciousness in this novel is linked to one of the dominant themes of the book. That is the difficulty of human communication and relationship, caused not only by the problem of finding the right word, but also by the discrepancy between words and deeds. Addie Bundren expresses this idea when she says, words are no good, that words don't ever even fit what they're trying to say at. We quickly discover that Addie is not the only character in the novel who feels this way. Others, Darl, Lardeman, Cash, Deweydale, also have difficulty in communicating their innermost thoughts and relating words to deeds. This problem of communication, of using language to create accurate representations of reality and meaningful, fulfilling relationships is everywhere present in As I Lay Die. We see it in the multiple and fragmented viewpoints, 
each character imprisoned in his or her own little box of stream of consciousness thought side by side on the pages of the book, sometimes overlapping in content, but never really merging into an overall unity. We see it in the disparity of styles within these individual sections, which are sometimes presented in the colloquial uh, folk language appropriate for the characters, but at other times in, in words and concepts that seem far beyond these characters' uh, circumstance and experience. We see it in the characterization of Dahl, who disdains speech, yet often knows things about other characters that have never been expressed in words. We see it perhaps best of all in Vardaman, who finds that all thought and language ultimately fail him, leaving him only with the metaphoric riddle, my mother is a fish. Our thoughts, whether private or expressed, never exactly match the thoughts of others. That's why we have the shifting viewpoints in As I Lay Die. The first thing that almost all readers notice about this book is how the narration is tossed about from one character to another, like uh, a football on the playground. First Darl speaks, then Cora, then Darl again, then Jewel, and so on through the book. Eventually, we learn, if we bother to keep count, that there are 15 different narrators and 59 chapters. Why would anyone choose to tell a story in this fashion? The principal result of Faulkner shifting the storytelling from one character to another is fairly easy to identify and quite compelling. We know from our own experience that when two or more people view an incident, they will see it and then tell it in somewhat different manner. Anyone who has ever served on a jury knows how a parade of witnesses, some hostile, some friendly, will present varying versions of the same event. And the juror must decide what actually happened and who's telling the truth and who isn't. It's the same with this novel with the reader playing the role of the juror. Is Cora right about which of the sons is at his favorite? What is Ansi's real reason for wanting to go to Jefferson? Why is Jewel so angry and spiteful? What's Darrell's problem? Answers to such questions depend on who's talking and who's reading. Clearly, what Faulkner is after here is not absolute truth with a capital T, but a little t truth that depends in large measure on viewpoint. I'd like now to share some remarks about the journey motif in As I Lay Die. Like many of the other modernists, Faulkner drew upon older myths and archetypes for his stories. Many of the world's great stories center on a journey of some type. As Joseph Campbell has reminded us, epic journeys in myth and literature are typically long and quite dangerous, requiring great courage and sacrifice, and thus are undertaken by gods or godlike heroes. Usually, too, these stories dramatize not only the growth and maturation of the hero, but also some benefit to the community that, that is derived from the hero's struggle, sacrifice, and triumph. Faulkner reprises this legendary pattern in his description of the Bundance trip through the North Mississippi countryside to Jefferson. And his use of the old familiar story involves many of the traditional elements. Certainly there can be no question of the Bundren's resolve and courage in the face of difficulty and danger. One can accurately apply to them the statement that Faulkner wrote about another group of characters in another book, they endured. Nevertheless, Faulkner's description of the Bundren's journey 
when compared to the older stories, seems largely ironic. While the Bundrans exhibit an impressive degree of tenacity and even courage, and while their quest eventuates in a successful conclusion, at least in terms of its stated intention of burying Addie, their heroism and triumph are undercut and diminished in a number of ways. For example, Faulkner's travelers are neither gods nor larger than life heroes. They are poor hill farmers whose outlandish attitudes and behavior flout common morality and decency and lead to their social estrangement. Additionally, whatever nobility may be found in keeping a promise to a dead wife and mother is mocked by the selfish motives of each of the travelers. Anson's remark is typical. Now I can get them tea. And finally, there seems to be no redemptive communal effect to the trials of the Bundrans. On the contrary, the trip leads to the disintegration of the family, not at all ameliorated by the introduction of a new Mrs. Bundren and a sharp division of neighbors. One final note, it's highly doubtful that William Faulkner or any other Mississippian ever witnessed a funeral procession like the one described in this book. But there is a historical precedent for such an action. In 1290, King Edward I of England commanded that the corpse of his wife, Eleanor of Castile, be transported from the north of England back to London for burial in Westminster Abbey. As a further tribute, Edward later ordered that memorial crosses be erected at each of the 12 places where the funeral procession made overnight stops. Was Faulkner perhaps aware of this historical event? And did he wish for Addie's death, funeral procession, and burial to be compared to that of a royal queen? Addie Bundren is no aristocrat and certainly no queen. But Faulkner clearly feels great compassion for her. And perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that he affords her the same respect and treatment once given to a legendary British queen. Thank you. And thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, I would now ask uh, Professor Lowe, would you give us our next talk, please? Oh, you're still muted. <clears throat> well, I'm in the unenviable position of following a master of Faulkner studies, but I'll do my best. Uh, you can hear me now, right? Yeah? Yes, yes I can. Okay, great. Um, this is the, probably the most taught book uh, Faulkner ever wrote, um, and of course it's one of his great masterworks. I don't think there's any question about that, but you know it's also the shortest, <laughs> and, and that has something to do with the way we teach these days. Um, I think though it's also his most perfectly written book. Uh, and I often think of this uh, in terms of um, Toni Morrison's first novel, The Bluest Eye, which I think is also a lapidary work. I mean, there's almost nothing critical to say about the writing. Uh, I won't say it's his greatest book, uh, because uh, I think Faulkner is kind of like Melville, in that Melville is always greatest when he writes about the sea, and, Mel and Faulkner is always greatest when he's considering the, the conundrums of our tragic racial history. And, and that means that we go to books like Absalom or Go Down Moses uh, for the full uh, presentation of Faulkner's gifts and uh, ability to courageously uh, consider the terrible things that lie at the heart of our national character. Um, but uh, in other words, it's not as ambitious as some of the others. 
There is a continuum in Faulkner, though. I mean, the uh, the idea that all of his books are different uh, has some merit, but I think that there's a pattern in um, in the way he develops um, uh, his central concerns, uh, starting really very beginning at the beginning of his career when he writes Soldiers Pay because one of the things that uh, I'm going to talk about at length uh, I hope uh, is the fact that Faulkner really had a terrible animus toward two of his brothers. There were four brothers and one of the things that I'm struck by as I look at this book is the central struggle uh, between Jewel and Darl for the disposition of their mother's body. Um, and ultimately it is adjudicated by a figure who doesn't loom large in our uh, uh, imagination at the beginning by Cash, who is the oldest son. And Faulkner was the oldest son. Um, and was always bitter about the fact that in his family after his childhood when he was the oldest and the tallest and the leader that he was eclipsed by these two brothers who became taller better looking more successful at athletics and um, became much more patronized by their father who was very often cruel to Faulkner and uh, I mean, for, for that matter he, he wasn't uh, <coughs> very kind to his wife uh, who said if she went to heaven she hoped Mr. Faulkner wouldn't be there. <laughs> but uh, this idea of uh, the family struggle is is something that I think so many uh, people go through. I mean it's not at all true that people uh, love and, and um, idealize their siblings. I know quite a few people who don't speak to their siblings sometimes. Uh, and so we have that uh, going on here too, but the other thing that um, I think is very memorable about this book is the way that Faulkner makes us care very deeply and respect very deeply people who usually are seen at the bottom of the social pyramid, uh, simple uneducated country people. Um, and the, the idea of um, of how to do that came to Faulkner, I think, in terms of the different voices that he would give these figures um, as he wrote the novel. Uh, because we have three kinds of utterances, it seems to me. We have conscious thought, where the characters speak to us and their neighbors and each other in very simple, direct language. Uh, and that makes it a lot easier to follow than some of the other passages because he then will take us into interior thought where the characters do not speak at all the way they would in ordinary life. They use much more complex language, Latinate uh, formulations, words they probably would never have heard. Um, but nevertheless, they're, they're working through things in this second level. The third level though is unconscious thought and this is where the stream of consciousness that uh, Professor Hamblin brought in is so important because we see there very poetic, uh, sometimes very confusing language that nevertheless has a, an incredible beauty and power uh, and it's a challenge to us to figure those kinds of utterances out. Uh, Professor Hamlin talked about uh, how Faulkner sometimes seems to him have thrown a deck of cards <laughs> on the table like 52 pickup. Well, that reminded me of what I tell my students when I inflict the sound and the fury on them. And I say, you know, the sound and the fury um, is a complex uh, structure and it's almost as if Faulkner had put together a novel kit and he t comes in the room and throws the pieces on the table and says, okay, this is a novel, the pieces of one, put it together. And I think that that is one of the ways in which this book is such a powerful uh, document in literary modernism, because modernism makes many more demands on the reader than the uh, traditions that preceded it, like naturalism and realism and the novel of manners and things like that. Um, but also Faulkner in that respect is a kind of aggressive toward the reader and um, 
I think there, there are times when students get angry because at him, at Faulkner, for creating these barriers to understanding with his confusing uh, formulations. But <coughs> again, this is uh, at the heart of modernism because Kafka said that it was the duty of the novelist to take an ax to the frozen heart of the reader to get through to the reader, to make the reader feel, to make the reader feel the agony and, and struggles of the characters. And that's certainly something that goes on in this book. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of things that are important in terms of the structure of the, the novel. Uh, it is, as Professor Hamblin said, a kind of simple story in that uh, this is about a journey. Uh, and other critics have compared it to the Odyssey. Um, I have compared it to the Exodus, because one of the things that also draws Faulkner into configuration with Melville is that both of them knew the Bible better than almost anybody in their generation of writers. And I think we've fallen away from understanding that because not that many people read the Bible anymore. Uh, but the Exodus um, is a story about people trying to get free. Well, here they're trying to get free of the mother's body. Uh, but they go through the trial by water, which is like the parting of the Red Sea. And remember, the Israelites had the pillar of fire that they had to consider. And Faulkner said, of course, he simply took simple people and put them through basic catastrophes, so the trial by water, the trial by fire. And I think we think about this these days when California is burning and Missouri and Kentucky are drowning. I mean, these, these are not things foreign to us. Um, and, but the idea of the endurance and the persistence of the Bundrens is, is one of the things that really impresses us as does their grief, because yeah, it's true, all, all of the people in the family, except Darl, have a reason for going to Jefferson. Um, and and Jewel, uh, Jewel has a reason in that he wants to honor his mother's wishes. But um, the, the grief of the family, especially in the long first section, and I've read this book many times, but I was struck in rereading this time at how long that first section goes on uh, where they're uh, waiting for her to die when Peabody comes, uh, the uh, building of the coffin, the rain, and the idea of the circle is something that I want to talk about because I think this uh, book uh, once again um, builds on the, the Bible because the centrality of the, the, uh, the circle um, in the Bible can be seen in the Exodus in that, of course, the Exodus would be circling back to the Promised Land. And the, the dominant uh, symbol for a journey many times is the wheel. Um, and the idea of the wheel uh, is very important in this book from the very beginning because, remember, Darl makes certain that Jewel is not there at the death of their mother uh, to get the, the farewell kiss. And this, this was a big thing in, in Faulkner's own time, too, in his family. Uh, when his mother died, uh, the, the, older, uh, the oldest brother would give her a kiss first, and Faulkner went to the, the coffin and kissed her. But the brother he really hated the most, John, was the youngest brother at that time, and he had the final farewell kiss. And this motif of the kiss and the mother's final blessing is a very big part of that big that first part of the book. Um, and uh, Darrell makes sure that, that uh, Jewel is not there. And in fact, one of the most extraordinary things about the book, which many people have remarked on, is that we hear about Addie's death from Darl, who is not there. I mean, it is it is a complete construct. There are several sections where he where he does that, and the the wheel. I don't know. I've got a little diagram here which you can't see probably, but you get the idea. It's the circle because one of the reasons uh, Darl and and Jewel are kept away so long for three days is that the 
one of the wheels on the wagon breaks and the spokes are scattered everywhere. And I would suggest that this family has been held together by Addie. She is the rim of the wheel. She's also the hub though. She's the center of the wheel. And then if you look at the spokes that radiate out, Cash would be at the top because Cash is really the true patriarch in the family. He makes the final patriarchal decision. Ants is kind of a cipher just like Faulkner's father was. Uh, then you have the highly sexualized characters of Darl, uh, of, excuse me, of uh, Jewel and Dewey Dell, and the similarity in their names, I think, shows you that. And also, of course, their uh, strong association with the horse and the cow, respectively. And then you have Darl and Vardaman, who have an affinity, and their names, once again, sound alike in many ways. Um, Darl is... Uh, his name is supposedly short for Daryl, I think Faulkner said that, but I've, all, I've always looked at it as a kind of fragment of a darling. I mean, he doesn't have a full identity because his mother never loved him, and the, the novel shows that in so many ways. But the, the circle uh, has uh, a, a quite a number of other uh, applications, too, because I want to uh, remind you that this, uh, this novel has 59 sections. Um, 59 is an interesting number because if you think of a clock, which we usually look at as a circle, when you go around the clock and you get to the completion of the circuit, you're at 59. And I, th I think that's uh, the, the way this, this works too. But on the other hand, um, the number 40 is very important in the Bible, uh, and, and it's used in this book repeatedly. Uh, Jewel clears 40 acres to get the horse that becomes a symbol of his mother. Um, but I have to tell you, I really think this novel is confusing until you get to Addie's section. Because Addie's section really explains so many questions that you might have had as a reader. And if you go through the novel and count which section her, hers corresponds to, it is episode 40. So the reader has gone through the wilderness and arrived at a, a, a kind of promised land of understanding at, at section 40. Um, also, uh, the, uh, the horse, um, if you look at the, the complicated maneuvers uh, for the price of the horse and so forth, you'll find out that ultimately the price is $40. So, I mean, Faulkner, is, he loves to um, use these kinds of uh, numerical um, instruments as well. Uh, also, the, the idea of Darl and Cash as the oldest of the, t the, the family uh, Darl is um, like Faulkner in a way because he's so creative and has such a gift with language and is very poetic. And you remember that Plato said that the artist was dangerous. He had to be uh, uh, restricted from the Republic because he goes up into the clouds with the gods and participates in a kind of madness. And the madness of Darl is uh, something that Faulkner addressed. He said, well, he was always crazy. I think th my students are always uh, betrayed by Faulkner in that they trust Darl. But, but the, the reason for that is that Darl gives them more information. He has more uh, uh, monologues than anybody else. And at the end, it just doesn't seem to some of them that, that he's the crazy one. They see many more candidates in the, in the novel. Uh, but Faulkner said he, he always was crazy. Uh, so there's an element of Faulkner in there, but there's also a much stronger element in some ways in Cash, because remember Cash is a carpenter. And Faulkner always used that metaphor for his craft, that he was a carpenter uh, who, who tried to create um, uh, a sturdy uh, novel. and. Uh, in fact, he did do carpentry himself quite a bit when he had Roanoke. So there's a lot of that going on. But I want to return to the Bible briefly because I'm going over my time. Um, one of the things that is very remarkable about this book is the 
the linguistic uh, development of cash because at the very beginning he speaks it monosyllabically he doesn't have very many poetic utterances or any at all really and then he has that very strange short uh, list of things I made it on the bevel you remember that uh, and uh, but by the end of the book he has really become much more eloquent and meditative and he's really been the one who has to make the decision if uh, to send Darrell to the insane asylum. Um, and uh, this goes back to the Bible because Moses in, uh, in, in his leadership of the uh, uh, Hebrew people to the promised land uh, was represented initially by his brother Aaron uh, because Aaron was eloquent, a great orator, and uh, he had power over the people. But eventually, remember, Moses was an Egyptian, and so he had to learn, presumably, Hebrew. And But by the end of the 40 years, he was conversant and had the power of, over the people through uh, oratory and rhetoric. And uh, God uh, punishes Aaron because Aaron worships the golden calf and leads the people astray. Uh, and in some versions of the he Hebraic myth, and um, Zora Neale Hurston used this in her masterpiece, Moses, uh, Man of the Mountain, Moses is commanded by God to kill Aaron, his brother. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of places in here where uh, murder and killing is mentioned. I won't go through the list, but at the very end, you must have been struck by the way Dewey Dell and, and uh, Jewel descend on Darl and, and Jewel says, kill him, kill him. Uh, and so he has to be taken out of the family. And I'll just conclude with another um, uh, suggestion uh, because um, Darl is sent to the insane asylum and uh, at the very end of the novel we have uh, Cash ruminating in a flash forward actually about how pleasant it is to sit in the the cabin with the radio that the new Mrs. Bundren has given them, the graphophone. And he says it's a shame that uh, Darl couldn't be here to hear this, but uh, this life, not his life. Uh, but when you look at the way that's written, uh, he doesn't say that that this life isn't his life. He, it ends with this life, his life. And it seems to me that is a kind of um, unconscious uh, recognition that Darl did see life for the chaos that it is and how it's full of uh, confusion and loss and, and, and death and that uh, Addie Bundren maybe might be right when she says that her father taught her that the, the reason for living is to be dead for a long time. And so Darl has to be taken out of the community. Of course Cash's other reason is that he burned down a barn which uh, Cash builds and I mean it's a man's property. I mean uh, this is the community's value trumping the personal value which is kind of sad. But um, the, the other thing I'll conclude with is uh, Emily Dickinson has a poem where she says, much madness is divinest sense. Um, a scent and you are rendered sane, demure, and you're handled with a chain. And that is Darl's fate. Okay, I could say a lot more if this is such a rich novel, but I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much. So, and so everybody, please put in questions. I'll be forced to come up with questions of my own if you don't. Um, and I will start with one from Suzanne Noel. Why does Faulkner give Addie only one chapter? And why does it appear when it does well into the book beyond the observation about it being the 40th chapter? Well, for either or both of you. I think he only gives her one uh, section because it's such a revelation and she's not the only one. I mean the other person who has one section is Jewel and you would think he would get a lot more and his is very revelatory too because he has a fantasy of being on the, remember they live on a mountain 
and he has a fantasy of throwing all of them down the hill, killing them, in effect. Uh, he says teeth and all, and of course the teeth, um, Freud shows us that if, you, uh, if men have dreams of their teeth being falling out or pulling out, that's a castration complex. And remember he had uh, Benji castrated in The Sound and the Fury, and this is, and the father wants to get new teeth, which is uh, compatible with him getting a new wife and sexual potency. Remember, uh, Addie pushed him away. They weren't having sex. So um, I think Addie's um, section is meant to be explosive and more powerful by the fact that it's only one and it's really kind of at the center of the book. But remember, Faulkner had done this in a, a more um, uh, powerful way in The Sound of the Fury because that book is some in, in so many ways circling around Caddy. She doesn't have any sections. It's only through others. And uh, we get so much about Addie from all the other characters and they come at her from every conceivable angle. I mean, uh, and her the directness of her, her speech too is uh, emphasized by the fact that these people who just use empty words who are totally hypocritical, Cora and Whitfield, they form an envelope around her. And uh, Eddie talks at length about how words just go up in the air and do doing goes so terribly creeping along the earth. And so uh, that's my answer. I don't know if Dr. Hamblin might have another one. Uh. I agree with uh, what you say about uh, her being the, the center of the book, and the explosive nature of her uh, uh, testimony. Uh, you, you know, uh, she, she's coming back from the dead to speak, and that's Dante and uh, Spoon River Anthology. There are other works where deceased characters uh, come back to speak. But, but in relation to uh, Addie, I'd like to comment on a couple of points that uh, Professor Lowe made. One about the, the, uh, the autobiographical elements in the book, the sibling rivalry, the, the conflict of the brothers. Uh, and, and that's true of uh, the portrait of Addie as well. Uh, Faulkner uh, had observed, uh, well, he observed one and experienced another. Uh, he, knew, he knew a lot about two failed marriages. Uh, the one he had observed, of course, had been his parents. And then uh, when he, as he was writing this book, he was experiencing his own uh, difficult marriage. Uh, you know, he had just recently uh, married uh, Estelle Franklin, uh, but she was not the uh, Estelle that he had fallen in love with uh, years earlier. And... Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, he, he's been writing about this. Uh, this is this is Caddy, in The Sound and the Fury, who's partly Estelle, uh, Temple Drake. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, one could argue that the characterization of Temple Drake, especially her rape, uh, is a kind of uh, revenge that Faulkner uh, uh, issues uh, on Estelle. And so here, here is Addie, and, and, uh, and so this failed marriage and uh, Faulkner has invested so much in that characterization. In, in a screenplay uh, in 1942 that he wrote in Hollywood called The De Gaulle Story, Faulkner has a character say, if you want to remove the dream uh, image that a man has in his head about a woman, marry her. <laughs> That's the way to get rid of uh, the, the, uh, the, this uh, dream image of the perfect woman. And, uh, so Faulkner had experienced that, uh, again, uh, through observing his own uh, parents' uh, marriage and now in his own, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, Addie Bundren is William Faulkner. Uh, so many of her views about the afterlife, about death, uh, about family, uh, about what her father taught her, uh, many, many of those views can be found uh, expressed by William Faulkner at various points in his life. Uh, there's another uh, aspect that, that uh, Professor Lowe uh, uh, did a beautiful job with in linking this uh, narrative to biblical influence. 
and uh, there's one other aspect there that I might mention. You know, we all uh, puzzle over what Vardaman means when he says, my mother's a fish. Uh, well, uh, at the literal level, uh, you know, his mother was alive, now she's dead. The fish was alive, now the fish is dead. And Vardaman drags it around uh, on the ground, and, uh, and so he makes this identification. But in terms of Christian symbolism, you know, the fish is, is a New Testament uh, symbol for Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if, if you look at what happens after Addie's death and after her, her central, uh, the central point in the book, uh, you know, now, now for, to, for Faulkner to use Christian symbols, he said that was part of his uh, boyhood, his upbringing. He just grew up with it. It was a part of the environment that he assimilated. Uh, to talk about Christian symbolism in Faulkner do, does not mean these are Christian books, you know, <laughs> uh, or that Faulkner was a Christian. It, it, these are literary devices that he draws upon, uh, partly to universalize the story, because it's all happened before. That's what the mythical method's all about. You keep repeating the old stories because they, they happen, they're happening again, they will happen still again. Uh, that's part of that circle that uh, Professor Lowe was talking about. But the, uh, the fish, af after, after Addie's testimony, you know, she, she, she lives on. She is resurrected. She lives on in the lives of this family. In fact, uh, they all, uh, they think about her more than any, even after she is dead, she continues to influence the family and is responsible for the, their getting in motion and doing the things that they do the rest of them all. So, so uh, uh, in some ways, she is a Christian symbol. The fish ties her to that. And, uh, and uh, in, in a very secular way, she is resurrected in this novel to influence the behavior of the family members uh, in, in, as they move on into the future. Uh, so I thought those were very telling points that Professor Lowe made, and I, I just wanted to comment on those. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to a second question from the audience. Uh, John Seward's, is there an argument for why As I Lay Dying is not the greatest American novel? And I want to push that a little bit because, in effect, I, I, I think, you know, all you need to say is it's the second bit, greatest American novel, and there you are. Um, but in a previous uh, webinar uh, there, you know, on Uncle Tom's Cabin, there was a discussion about how James Baldwin had particularly excoriated um, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know, tried to say it's a very bad novel. You know, when we were talking about Cooper, Mark Twain tried to you know, bash uh, James Fenimore Cooper's reputation. Is there any really notable, well-written and even persuasive you know, essay uh, or you know, book arguing you know, Faulkner's flaws, and in particular, As I Lay Dying's flaws, which has a similar role in you know, the literary conversation. Well, early in his career, there certainly were. I, I think Clifton Fadiman was notorious uh, for trashing all of his novels, <laughs> including this one, uh, saying that he was like, you know, dipping into the sewer of Freudianism and sensationalism and uh, his characters were on, I mean, on and on, he was really negative, but I can't think of anybody, you know, closer to our era who would dare say this is not a good novel. I think it's it's got ultra canonical status. I mean, it is a classic, there's no question. Well, here, here's an interesting thing about Falk, you know, uh, we debate which is his greatest novel. Uh, it's not an easy question. Mm -mm. When you say Hawthorne, the Scarlet Letter. Yeah. You say Melville, Obi Dick. You say Twain, Huckleberry Finn. There, there's no doubt for many of our writers which book is their masterpiece. Uh, Faulkner, some claim Absalom, Absalom. I, I'm in that camp. I think that's his greatest novel. Some think uh, The Sound and the Fury. Some think light in August. 
your protege, uh, Professor Lowell, at the Faulkner Center, Chris Rieger. He's very fond of light in August. Right. Did you teach him that? Uh, well, I wrote my dissertation on it. <laughs> we, we, have, we don't know that, the, uh, in my view, uh, I would rank Absalom, The Sound and the Fury, As I Lay Dying, Light in August, and Go Down Moses. I would put them in that order. So next year, I might use a different go down. Moses has really risen in my estimation over the years. But the point is, there are critics who believe that any one of those five is Faulkner's masterpiece. May I interrupt a and moment? You can't say that about uh, many other writers. Shakespeare, of course, you know, which is Shakespeare's greatest tragedy. Do, uh, if, if I may know, interrupt. So, do people prize different aspects of Faulkner's artistry when they choose a particular novel? That is, if you're saying The Sound and the Fury, is there one aspect of what Faulkner does that you like more? Is there another aspect for Go Down Moses? Or is it it's a question, the same artistries are appearing in all the novels. It's a question of the execution. Well, for me, Faulkner's real legacy uh, uh, Professor Lowe hit on his main subject, of course, which is race. Uh, but Faulkner's real legacy, ultimate legacy, it seems to me, may not be in theme or subject matter, but technique. Mm -hmm. Technique. Uh, the different way, experimenting. He, he faulted Hemingway for not splashing around trying to experiment. Faulkner never wanted to do the same thing again. He he, he, he did so many different forms of narration. And, and, and uh, you know, we talk now about the international fault. Uh, the internationals, uh, the Chinese and Japanese scholars, for example, who come to our Faulkner Center, they don't know a thing about the American South. They don't know a whole lot about slavery or the Civil War. They don't come to Faulkner as a Southern writer writing about uh, so many of the southern aspects that we focus on, and you and you and and you know the technique is lasting. The, the, the South that Faulkner wrote about is gone with the wind. Cotton is no longer king. Uh, the third largest crop in Mississippi now is catfish. <laughs> you know the the South that Faulkner writes about. Uh, it's like his farm. I went to his farm uh, a couple of weeks ago. I visited it again. Uh, you know, Faulkner wanted to raise mules when tractors were already beginning to displace mules in farming. It was not a good farm operation. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, Professor Lowe, that's why he put that hated brother out there to run it for him. Yeah, you know, John, he, he named one of the mules, mules so Big John, him. after his brother. <laughs> And in some ways, Faulkner's work is, is like that far. Some of it becomes dated. It's out of date in some ways. But now, now I've, written a, I've written more probably about Faulkner's technique than I have about his subject matter or his theme. So you have to recognize where I'm coming from in that regard. But the, it's the technique that is, uh, that is worldwide and imitated and uh, the... the uh, uh, so so much of again of Faulkner's uh, content is is gone with the wind. Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm writing the biography of uh, Ernest Gaines, who was profoundly influenced by Faulkner, not so much in terms of the florid style, but in terms of his structure and attention to form. Because Gaines said, "Without form, there is no art." And uh, that's one of the th reasons he's been condemned by uh, other people uh, in his tradition for not being um, more militant and so forth. But he was profoundly interested in the, the structure of language and uh, the shaping of a narrative um, and the ways that those things could create new apertures for the reader. And Faulkner does that abundantly, always, every, everywhere. Thank you. I am going to go to a next, the next comment. I, I am doing these in order. And this has an extremely long German word in it. So if I get it remotely pronounced right, I, I want applause from the audience. So from Morgan T. In similar lines of hermeneutics to the German Vergangenheitsbewältigung, 
how, if at all, does As I Lay Dying shed light on the processes by which Faulkner's character uh, and himself, I presume, come to turn with, with the terms of the Southern past and processes of convergence, order, and chaos, or existing to some extent in that liminal space between Metaxi, thinking in line with Eric Vogelin. I'm not sure I got all that. I heard all of it. Uh, John, if you if you did, <laughs> pitch in. Uh, well, I was just in Germany two weeks ago, so maybe I, that'll filter my response. But I think the, uh, the, th the thing that question brings up is uh, Faulkner's um, awareness of history. Uh, and, of course, that's very closely linked to memory um, and guilt and tragedy and, and race. Uh, but one of the things that I do when I teach Faulkner in a, a seminar uh, or a, an undergraduate class, the book I start with is not this one, but The Unvanquished, because I think that's the most um, easy book to comprehend in terms of the writing, but it's also, I think, a very underrated book. It's a very profound look at uh, the Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, and Professor Hamlin was talking about the, the fact that when Faulkner was writing, the great book was Gone with the Wind, which won the Pulitzer Prize and has malignantly affected so many people's imagination of the American South. And, and Faulkner said when he was writing Absalom, but he was writing the uh, Unvanquished about the same time, he wanted to get the plug hats and the hoop skirts out of it, although of course in The Unvanquished the, the comic scene is Granny protecting two little boys under her hoop skirt. But the, the idea of um, not just Southern history but American history uh, is a constant resource for Faulkner and he's always trying to create an alternate history, uh, one that would be truer to the, the lives he saw lived around him. And he also was capable of seeing that even in uh, northern Mississippi, which at his time was very impoverished and remote, that it could be representative of life everywhere, that it that it, its its tragic past and present had relevance all over the world. And I think the fact that um, all these scholars come to the Faulkner Conference from other countries speaks to that fact. Uh, because it, it, I don't think uh, As I Lay Dying, though, is, a great, is one of the greater contributions to this uh, focus on history, although um, my former student Ted Atkinson does do a good job with this uh, in his book on Faulkner and the Great Depression, where, uh, because this, this book um, does give you a, a sense of poverty, even though it was written, uh, you know, right as the Depression was beginning, uh, and Faulkner didn't have the full uh, awareness of what would unfold, he is talking about an impoverished section, and uh, uh, that's one of the ways in which Ants Bundren does come ac across persuasively, uh, you know, uh, despite all the ways he irritates and disgusts us, he does talk about the ways in which um, industrial culture and finance capitalism have created, you know, issues for his family. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but Professor Hamblin, do you want to uh, go from that anywhere, or I'm ready for the next question, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just mention, by the way, for international influence, when I, I spent a semester in Spain as a college student, and I still distinctly remember a professor of one of my classes saying, I worship Faulkner. Faulkner is a god, which was, I think, for me, the first time I quite realized, yes, everybody around the world knows about Faulkner. Mm. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're considering a lot of serious topics here, and... Uh, Maybe we need to be reminded that uh, one aspect of this book is how funny it is. Uh, and, uh, and that speaks to somewhat to Faulkner's technique as well. Uh, the greatest writers uh, view life as a whole. Uh, they know it's sometimes tragic and sad, but they also uh, write about humor and uh, uh, happy endings. 
uh, Shakespeare, you know, wrote tragedies and he also wrote happy ending comedies. Uh, he saw life as, as a whole. Our greatest writers do that. Uh, and and one, one of the great aspects of Faulkner's work is this uh, looking at both sides of life. Uh, life is terrible. Life is, uh, is, is tragic. But there's also a lot of uh, humor and, and fun. And, uh, and I, at one time, I made a list of some of the humorous lines in the, As I Lay Dying. And, and uh, I, I came up with uh, Jewel says, you know, because if there is a God, what the hell is he for? Uh, and says, uh, God, he, before he says, uh, uh, now I can get them teeth, he says, God's will be done. Now I can get them teeth. And Tull says, I think that if nothing but being married will help a man, he's darn nigh hopeless. <laughs> or on uh, marriage. Bartman says, my mother is a fish. Cash, you remember, asked how far he fell off the church. 28 foot, four and a half inches, about. <laughs> Darl, on Jewel's suspected lover. She's sure a stayer. I used to admire her, but I downright respect her now. Addie, uh, about Cora's self-righteousness. Uh, Cora, she says, who could never even cook. Armstead, a man ain't no different from a horse or a mule. Come long, come short, except a mule or a horse has got a little more sense. So the, the great writers, Shakespeare, Emily Dickinson, Faulkner, they look at both sides of life. And uh, I think sometimes in our emphasis upon the tragic Faulkner, uh, we, we, we forget uh, maybe the, the other aspect of his work. Um, and some of that, uh, a, a, a book that's rising in my estimation almost year by year is The Hamlet. Uh, which is which is a comic masterpiece um uh, and uh much better i think than the other two volumes of the trilogy snow, oh, snow yeah. trilogy but uh, uh the father's use of humor is uh, is a very important part of his technique part of his i, think, life, I couldn't of agree more and i've uh i've often thought that this book is uh almost unique in world literature in the way it balances comedy and tragedy, because I don't know of any other book that does does this so well. I mean, there are others, of course, like Don Quixote, which is hilarious, but also sad. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of great things in, that you've quoted already, but uh, Peabody especially is really funny when he uh, comments on um, how ridiculous this journey is. And I often ask my students to make a list of the funny things in it because we, we're we so torn. We make fun of the, the Bundrens and then at the same time we feel deeply for them in the other passages. I mean, it's, it's as you say, giving you a way to look at all aspects of life. And I quite agree. Um, humor is something that some of the, most of the great writers have employed uh, extensively, uh, Mark Twain is maybe the greatest example. If you look at a book like Puddinghead Wilson, which is about slavery and is tragic, it's also hilarious. Sorry, I got muted. Yeah. I was muted for a moment there. I'm going to shift to a different question. Uh, Teresa Schuster's, um, Faulkner is referred to as a modernist. I thought that he was Southern Gothic. What distinguishes the two? Is he both? Well, one aspect of modernism uh, is uh, what T.S. What, uh, Eliot called the mythical method. Uh, he uh, was reviewing Joyce's Ulysses and uh, he said that uh, now writers would use the mythical method. And, uh, and, uh, and he said that was a way of, of, of finding order out of the chaos that had, had resulted from the collapse of 19th century absolutism and, and, and during World War I. Uh, and so this, this reaching back into uh, history to find the archetypes and patterns of older stories. Uh, O'Neill, of course, used Greek tragedy and retold it. 
Hemingway used uh, the Fisher King and a lot of, of, uh, of the ancient uh, myths and stories. Faulkner, as Professor Lowe pointed out, uh, typically uses the Bible. Uh, but uh, this, this, uh, this use of ancient materials and recasting it into a, a modern guise, that's, that's one of the key features of, of modernism. And, and uh, uh, Faulkner is one of the, one of the uh, experts, of course, at that. I think also, uh, all the way through Faulkner, there's a tremendous influence uh, by T.S. Eliot, uh, particularly The Wasteland and Proofrock. You see that in so many of his uh, early works, but also in some of the later ones, like Pylon, for instance. Uh, but the whole idea of fragmentation and confusion and the loss of fixed values, the, the failure of uh, religion, uh, the, the changing uh, gender roles, uh, all of that is a very important part of Faulkner. And I don't think we should ever forget uh, <clears throat> the, the three figures who uh, destroyed the, the status quo uh, beginning in the 19th century, uh, Darwin, Marx, and Freud. And uh, there are elements of all of them in Faulkner, actually, but the most, the strongest influence, I believe, is Freud. And we don't have any direct evidence that Faulkner read Freud, but I don't see how he could not have. Uh, uh, people will at least admit when he was living in New Orleans, he was with people who were just abuzz with all of Freud's theories and so forth. And uh, particularly in Sanctuary, who's another, that's another book that I am reevaluating because uh, I agree with the five great masterworks we talked about at the beginning, but I would add uh, The Hamlet and uh, Sanctuary. I think there's seven really towering works, and I like The Unvanquished too, but uh, Sanctuary would be impossible without the influence of Freud, it seems to me. Uh, and uh, the, the theory of uh, sibling rivalry proceeds from psychoanalytic theory because Freud's disciple, Adler, uh, uh, wrote extensively about that. Of course, Freud didn't like it because it was a threat to his Oedipal configuration, so he had a falling out with Adler like he did with so many other people. But uh, sexuality is a tremendous subject in Faulkner, more, more so in some of the other books than in this one. But certainly Dewey Dell brings that up very powerfully. And, and Addy, of course, uh, particularly in terms of the way he uses the Scarlet Letter, uh, the whole idea of sin and the clothing that is sin and they take it off. It's a kind of reversal of what Hawthorne is doing. There's, a, there's another aspect of modernism uh, and the, the best example, of course, is Joyce's Ulysses. Uh, we, we know these modernists used the old stories and retold them, but they often inverted them. Uh, and used them ironically, as Faulkner does, it seems to me, somewhat with the journey motif in uh, As I Lay Die. Mm -hmm. But but if you look at uh, uh, Joyce's treatment of Leopold Bloom and, and comparing him uh, as a modern day Ulysses, uh, you're taking a heroic past and you're reflecting it into an ordinary, uh, everyday uh, present. Now, what we can't quite know for sure with these writers is whether they, they are do, they're doing that reversal uh, to point out how far the modern world has fallen from some heroic ideal, or are they lifting up the ordinary up to the level of the heroic ideal? You know, uh, in Shakespeare's day, uh, you, uh, you had to be you had to be a somebody to have a play written about you, <laughs> king, a prince. Uh, in fact, he even let them use a special language. They they use their own language, blank verse. When the commoners speak, they they use prose. They're not even allowed. So this distinction, this aristocratic hierarchy, then democracy comes in, and with democracy, you can now have. Uh, a semi-literate boy, uh, Huckleberry Finn. You can have a, 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 a leather-stocking uh, uh, frontiersman. Uh, you, you can have uh, Willa Cather's uh, mm -hmm. Myatonia. 
Ralph Ellison's uh, uh, African American uh, 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 disadvantage uh, striving. And so, with democracy, you elevate the the lowly. You you elevate the masses. Uh, and 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 I I think Professor Lowe is is quite right that in many ways, as I lay dying, it, 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 there is humor, there is sometimes satire, there is this irony that's involved, but but there's also, as I mentioned in my concluding remarks, there there's tribute here. The, these ordinary people are, are special. They're, they're, they 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 have value. Uh, Faulkner uh, typically didn't care much for the high and the mighty. Uh, the rich, the rich, the wealthy. He, he often uh, treated them with uh, even contempt. But he had a great compassion for the poor, the uh, disenfranchised, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the enslaved. Uh, and so I think in Faulkner's, in Faulkner's treatment, I think sometimes the, 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 he is elevating the ordinary into the realm of the important, important uh, uh, value, and uh, and and so uh, we we have mixed we have mixed feelings about the Bundrens, and we don't exactly know what Faulkner's attitude toward them was, but but I think there is something uh, there in their behavior, the, 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 their commitment, uh, the journey they make, uh, something to be admired even. I endorse that, and I think there's uh, two two really great examples of that beyond this book: uh, Joe Christmas and Mink Snopes, uh, <clears throat> because they're both murderers, uh, and but they they have terrible lives that have led to those murders, uh, and I don't really care for the mansion um, for the most part, but the story of Mink Snopes is magnificent. I mean, he is one of Faulkner's greatest characters, and. You could argue that Joe Christmas is his most unique creation, perhaps, uh, because Light in August is such a powerful work, and the achievement he he wins there, making us care so deeply for Joe Christmas, who's just this ordinary uh, 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 country guy who has an extraordinary past, as we learn, uh, and, and the, the evil figures who have shaped and misshaped him. Um, he becomes very moving to us, uh, and uh, I think that that's a good example. And this is something that Richard Wright would do too, very powerfully, in Native Son, where his central figure is a double murderer. Uh, but we care we care about him at the end. I mean, he he moves us. He makes us see things that we never thought we would see about people like him. And that, that is the achievement of a really great artist, it seems to me. Of course, Dostoevsky had done that with Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment. We could name any other number of, of European works like that, I suppose. One of Faulkner's unsung heroes, I think, uh, one who doesn't get nearly the attention he deserves, is Byron Bunch in Light in August. Mm -hmm. He's an ordinary person, but he, he's the catalyst who, who, of course, befriends Lena. Uh, he... Uh, brings uh, Gail Hightower out of his tower. And, and, uh, and so uh, a character like that, uh, uh, Jackson Fentry uh, in, in the, the short story, uh, uh, help me with the title, uh, uh, the movie, the Duval movie, uh, the, 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 the farmer that has to give up the adopted son, you remember. Uh, there, there's so many Jackson Fentries and Byron Bunches in Faulkner, just ordinary, everyday people. The, Faulkner called them the little people. But that's democracy. We celebrate everyone, diversity. We celebrate each and every one, e pluribus unum. Uh, and, uh, and, and so in that regard, Faulkner is one of the most democratic of our writers, I think. Mm -hmm. Sorry, unmuting again. Thank you, I say, I'm going to say. Um, I'm going to go up for a bit. A question which is very specific from Daniel. Please describe Faulkner's relationship with his editor. And I would say, add to that, why does this matter for those of us who are uninitiated in the details? Well, he had several editors. 
Um, and at the beginning of his career, they were really problematic because they thought his works were crazy, too long, I mean, especially what became Flags in the Dust, you know, which was originally Sartorus, and they forced him to cut it severely. I mean, he had he, he couldn't do it. He had to get his friend to come in and uh, chop it down. Um, but of course, we now read Flags in the Dust, and the same thing is true of um, If I Forget the Jerusalem, which used to be called the Wild Palms and so forth. But he was fortunate in getting some other um, really good editors. Um, uh, Jonathan, what is his name? Bob, you probably remember. Uh, K. Parton Smith, when he left um, his original publisher and, and uh, went with uh, uh, his new uh, editor to um, publish The Sound and the Fury, um, that that became a, a very big help for him because he started working with editors who really understood his greatness and of course once he got to Random House and he was dealing with uh, people like Bennett Cerf and so forth, uh, by then everyone uh, recognized his genius, although maybe they should have taken more control <laughs> at that point because some of his later works, um, you know, maybe could stand some adjustment, particularly the the town and the mansion. Uh, but I don't know, Bob may have another view of that, I don't know. <laughs> well, Carl, Carl, uh, Erskine, Erskine uh, and then uh, Sax Cummins uh, was not only uh, his editor at uh, Random House, uh, the last one, I, I suppose, one of the last, but uh, also a close friend and confidant. Uh, Cummins uh, was slipped into Oxford once from New York. Uh, uh, to help uh, uh, Faulkner recover uh, from from a, an al alcohol episode, uh, so Cummins was very very important. He and of course uh, deserved a lot of credit for Faulkner's finishing a fable. Uh, he, he probably couldn't have finished that book without Sax Cummins. So so Faulkner was, uh, as John says, very fortunate to have good editors. Uh, I'm not as big a fan as some people, though, of the corrected editions. Uh, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't object to uh, the, the editions uh, being, uh, be, being, being issued, but, but I, I don't like to see them replace uh, the earlier issues. I, I, I like flags in the dust, but I wish we could still... Uh, find Sartorus without having to go to use book sites. So uh, I, I, uh, I, I kind of I kind of favor the books, the, the, the texts that Faulkner lived with and accepted his whole life. And uh, I'm not always uh, in favor of uh, of, uh, of uh, corrected editions. And uh, as wonderful as Flags in the Dust is, it's, it's really Douglas Day's guesswork. <laughs> about uh, the novel that Faulkner may have written. And if you look at the manuscripts, you'll, you'll see it, 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 it was virtually impossible task to reconstruct that novel. And uh, they did it, of course. Uh, and he, for what he was doing, he did a good job. But uh, we, we should not ever uh, absolutely believe that that was the flags in the dust that Faulkner uh, wrote. Uh, just too many questions about the structure, the order, the pages, all of that. Uh, but uh, Faulkner was fortunate in uh, the, the. But the, the the last the late work, John. Uh, I've argued that Faulkner's later work. Uh, you know, we, we think it's we think it's uh, it's 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 it's, it's um, a decline. That's what we traditionally think. You know, there, there's, uh, there, there, there's uh, a lot of critics uh, view Faulkner the way they, they, they talk about Henry James. You know, there, there's uh, James the first, James the second, and James the great pretender. <laughs> and so here we have Faulkner the apprentice, Faulkner the uh, genius, and then Faulkner in decline. But I would point out, as I have done in a couple of essays, uh, Faulkner's late work follows his time in Hollywood. He's no longer a high modernist. He's writing filmic fiction, influenced by Hollywood. And he's doing a good job with it. 
Uh, his later novels are more like screenplays. That's why uh, The Reavers and Intruder in the Dust can so easily translate into the film without a whole lot of editing. Yeah, they're the only two good films of his work, too. And so uh, I don't see Faulkner's uh, later work necessarily as decline. And there's some other critics like Jim Carruthers and Teresa Towner and, uh, and even Noel Pope uh, who, who agree that uh, some of that later work is substantial and of value. But, but I see Faulkner as writing in a different style, a different mode. And, uh, and, that, and, and just as his fiction influenced his Hollywood work, so did Hollywood influence his later fiction. Faulkner said he tried to keep all that in separate rooms, but that's not psychologically uh, feasible. It's impossible. You can't separate. Uh, and so uh, it, it's understandable and predictable that that uh, that Hatafa gets into the Hollywood screenplays and the Hollywood work gets into the later Faulkner fiction. Uh, I think we're fortunate, too, that the, the new Carl Rolison two-volume biography does a really good job with his Hollywood career because he read all the uh, screenplays and adds substantially, I think, to what you're talking about in terms of uh, changes in his style. Because, uh, as you suggest, Faulkner was a protean writer. I mean, he there were certain themes and preoccupations that are constant throughout his work. But he, he did change his style. Uh, and I think he was always aiming at a new kind of perfection. Uh, the way he described, you know, the fa splendid failure of The Sound and the Fury. I mean, he was always trying to go beyond what he had already achieved. I agree that Intruder and The Reavers are, are his two best movies. But uh, uh, since we're talking about As I Lay Dying here, I, I, I like Franco's uh, version of As I Lay Dying. And the split screen, the way that he tried to capture the, the, the different uh, uh, monologues, interior monologues with the split screen. Uh, and so, uh, you know, most, uh, I wasn't as happy with his The Sound and the Fury, but, but I thought, I thought uh, As I Lay Dying was a pretty good movie. I am I'm torn between two questions um you know can there be some digression on Faulkner's grappling with race and then when teaching Faulkner as I lay dying to undergraduates and graduates what is easy for current students to connect with and what is most difficult um Oh, you know, answer them both. Um, <laughs> no, um, I guess, could you perhaps do, do the grappling with race, but it may be actually, and, and then if you can also maybe add a little bit about how it teaches and the difficulties as well, it'd be lovely to get both of those in in our time. Well, I think this is um, becoming more of a problem than it used to be uh, for good reasons and bad reasons in that uh, all the that we've gone through with Black Lives Matter and you know thinking rethinking about uh, certain words that we could and, and should not use or even read from a quoted text. Um, I went to the Society for Study of Southern Literature meeting and I went to a Faulkner session and one of the panelists said that she doesn't teach Faulkner anymore it's not worth it uh, because of the problems with you know the presentation of race and his use of the n-word and so forth and um, I think we need to find ways of dealing with this because of course you could just say this is presidentism but on the other hand we do applaud our our students the younger generation uh, being more tolerant and and demanding you know um, in the classroom and so forth but uh, this is a problem with Faulkner be partly because he was courageous in his own time with grappling with these issues you don't see Fitzgerald or Hemingway um, uh, having the courage to go into racial matters to any great extent I mean if, if Faulkner had death threats I mean his own family his brothers hated him for his position his mother turned against him because of the the liberal things he said, of course, when he was drunk, he said some other things that were just the opposite. But uh, I think we have to look at the, uh, the achievement of the literature in its own time. I mean, it's really a difficult thing to do in the classroom, I think, but we, we have to do it because I've always said Faulkner is our Shakespeare. 
I mean, to me, he is the greatest writer. I mean, he's not my favorite person in the literary canon, but he is the greatest uh, writer, I think. I, I mean, the only challengers are maybe Melville uh, and Twain and James and Toni Morrison. I mean, that's it. So. I think uh, the question uh, suggests two things to me. Uh, one is race and the problem that uh, uh, proposes. Uh, I, I dealt with that later in my later teaching career by pairing Faulkner with Toni Morrison, for example. Mm -hmm. And if you if you put the African American writer there beside Faulkner, they they're using the same words, they use similar themes. Uh, off, and of course, we know Morrison was greatly influenced by Faulkner, though she uh, uh, admitted it less and less the older she got. Uh, but uh, I, I would sometimes deal with the race question uh, by pairing Faulkner with an African American writer, particularly Morrison, sometimes Richard Wright. But uh, a bigger problem for teaching Faulkner for me was uh, persuading the students that they had to read it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, uh, they just they just don't want to read the book a second time and and you have to you can't read the modernists you have to reread them mm -hmm. and i would say to my student you 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 know what kind of music do you like and they would tell me and i'd say okay you go buy an album and you listen to it one time and then you put it in the closet you never listen to it again what kind of art do you like you buy a painting you, you look at it one time you hide it in the closet no it's only in literature that students think that it doesn't deserve a revisit, rereading. And uh, and I would tell them what Faulkner said. Mr. Faulkner, uh, some people say they have trouble. They've read your books three times and they can't understand them. What would you suggest? He said, read it four times. <laughs> and that's, that's uh, so how do you get students and the general public to be willing to spend time with novels and even be willing to reread them all great literature shakespeare dickens whoever deserves to be reread but uh sometimes students don't want to do that and so they want short books and they they don't want to have to read it a second time that's a hurdle with fault mm -hmm. thank you all right thank you um it's getting towards 3.30, so I would like at this point to ask each of you, would you be so kind as to give a concluding remark of perhaps a minute? And I guess you know, in uh, reverse order or so. So uh, Professor Lowe, might I get a minute from you first in conclusion? Well, I think this uh, book is well chosen by this uh, forum because it is one of the great literary masterpieces in the American canon, but it's also a masterpiece in the world canon. Um, and one of the things that also makes this book stand out in the Faulkner um, list is the focus on the family, because uh, people from the left and the right in our own time have talked about the attacks on the family, the disintegration of the family, the difficulty of uh, familial relations, and this book is quintessentially about the family uh, and every aspect, fraternity, sorority, uh, this, they have a sister, uh, the parental relationship, the relationship of the family to the community is very marked here. I mean, that's, uh, there are uh, 15 narrators, seven of them are the family, but eight are members of the community and they all uh, have a reading of the family and an interaction with the family. So it's not just about individuals, it's about community and the thing that links individuality and community is the family because uh, Juliet Mitchell, who's a very important psychoanalytic critic that I've used a lot in my study of Faulkner and Fraternity, points out that it is through your siblings that you get the foundation for relating to other people, for making friendships and uh, reaching out to the community. And this is something that is often forgotten when we keep configuring everything with the vertical relationship of the parents and the Oedipal Electra syndromes and so forth. I think it bears um, much more um, work in terms of understanding the horizontal relationships 
that affect our lives, that go through our siblings, our cousins, our kin, out into the wider community. So I could say a lot of other things, but I think that's the main thing I, I came away with from rereading this book, which is always a pleasure. And I haven't really read it closely lately because, um, you know, I teach it all the time. And in fact, I'm teaching a course this term, a graduate seminar that focuses on Faulkner and Gaines. And I've taught it before, it's really a great combo, and this goes back to what Bob was saying, you know, bringing uh, Faulkner in conjunction with an African-American writer. Um, so, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, all the things that we've talked about today are illustrative of the, the power of this book and the way it, it has a future, definitely. Thank you. Professor Hamlin. I go back uh, to uh, my impression years and years ago, technique. Uh, what, what amazes me about the novel is the technique. Faulkner called it a tour de force, you know, and uh, I, I, just, I just think his experimentation with narrative form uh, and uh, he does it in every book, but, uh, but in terms of technique and experimentation, this might be at the top of the list. And, and that's, uh, I think that's why I love the book so much. Thank you both so much then. Um, look, thank you to the audience. Thank you. Uh, the questions were yours. The seminar, the webinar is for you. Um, and it's for you and it's made by you. Thank you very much all. I will just mention one, if you enjoyed this at all, I, I'll put a shout out. National Association of Scholars is always looking for members. Look us up, might be fun. Um, two, I will repeat, if you had any leftover questions or any that occurred to you going forward, just send them to me, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L -L at nas.org, and I'll be glad to forward them to the professors. And again, um, this will be recorded and on our website uh, within 24 hours, you will be able to see it. And we will continue to have more um, webinars going forward in our Great American Literature series, including Tony Morrison's The Beloved in not too many weeks from now. So that's, I think, it for uh, housekeeping and all. Thank you all again so very, very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Bob. Great to see you.